Tonight on Y News. Controversial anti-drug campaign of the Philippine National Police of Lantokhan to stay but will undergo retooling. Isabel and Cagayan provinces brace for possible flooding and landslides due to tropical storm Ramon. President Rodrigo Duterte to validate reports on two members of the cabinet allegedly involved in corrupt practices. Uh, Solon clarifies there is no error in the 307 million peso, 507 million peso proposed budget for the rehabilitation of Cannon Road in Baguio City. And the Department of Environment and Natural Resources targets to make Manila Bay swimmable before 2019 ends. Good evening. The Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council of Isabela and Cagayan Provinces gears up for possible flooding and landslides as Tropical Storm Ramon is expected to make landfall tonight. From Tugigarao, Cagayan, Joan Nano tells us why live. Joan, go ahead. Yes, good evening, Jago. The Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council of Isabela and Cagayan is bracing for heavy rainfall as Tropical Storm Ramon is set to hit the provinces starting tonight. The Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office has prepared all the rescue equipment, evacuation center, and relief goods as authorities gear up for possible evacuation of residents living along coastal and low-lying areas. Based on Pagasa's forecast, Isabela and Cagayan Province will experience light to moderate with intermittent heavy rains beginning tonight, brought by Tropical Storm Ramon. Authorities warns residents of possible landslide and flooding. In Isabela, among the critical towns monitored by the PDRRMC are Santa Maria, Cabagan, Santo Tomas, Delfin Albano, Benito Suliben, and Don Mariano. They are also closely monitoring the possible overflowing of the Cagayan River once the Magat Dam releases water. Once the situation worsens, the PDRRMC will order forced evacuation of residents within those areas. Yung mga tao ma is uh, nasanay na sila kasi ayaw na nila yung forced evacuation dahil yung preemptive evacuation meron na kaming message ma'am. Please uh, ano, lumikas na kayo. Otherwise, uh, they will be forced to be evacuated. Yung PNP at saka army ma'am, bubuhatin ka. So, you have no choice. On the other hand, residents near the Cagayan River say they will cooperate once the local government orders the evacuation. Some prefer to temporarily stay with their relatives who live in elevated houses. Ready naman. Eh, kumbaga, ano, uh, meron kaming evacuation center sa municipal gym. Kompleto naman yung facility. Kompleto naman yung mga gamit. Especially sa rescue. Nililipat kami dyan sa magandang bahay dyan kasi kapang anak namin yan. Kasi sabi ng may-ari, pag may bagyo o baha, dyan kami lahat nililipat sa, dyan, sa mataas na bahay na bago. As of now, Jago, the situation here in Cagayan and in Isabela remains normal with continuous power supply. The local government officials have not ordered evacuation. The PDRRMC has suspended classes and work in the entire province of Isabela as they brace for the effects of Tropical Storm Ramon by tomorrow while the Cagayan uh, Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office has yet to announce work and class of suspension for tomorrow. Shargo? Thank you. Joan Nano reporting live from Tugigarao, Cagayan. <music> Tropical Storm Ramon is expected to make landfall anytime during the weekend according to the State Weather Agency Pag-asa. As of Pagasa's 5 p.m. forecast, Tropical Storm Ramon is now at 500 kilometers east of Balero Aurora, packing with maximum sustained winds of 65 kilometers per hour and gustiness of up to 80 kmh. It moves to north northwest direction at 15 kilometers per hour. Tropical cyclone wind signal number two remains hoisted over Catanduanes, while signal number one is raised over the eastern portion of Isabela, Northern Aurora, Polillo Island, Camarines Norte, Camarines Sur, and Albay. Pagasa said 
Ramon is likely to make landfall between Saturday evening and Monday morning but is expected to weaken into a tropical depression once it hits land mass. The weather agency said light to moderate with intermittent heavy rains will prevail in Bicol region, Quezon and the eastern portions of Isabela and Cagayan. Residents in these areas are advised to take precautionary measures against possible landslides and flash floods. Meanwhile, sea travel remains dangerous, especially for small sea crafts over the seaboards of areas under TCWS, the seaboards of northern Luzon, and the eastern seaboards of Aurora and Quezon due to prevailing or forecast rough sea conditions. Students and employees in Calapan, Mindoro participated in today's nationwide earthquake drill. Meanwhile, BMPI employees showed earthquake preparedness. Sher Sherwin Kulubong tells us why. A magnitude 7.1 earthquake hit Calapan, Oriental Mindoro, which lasted for one minute. The students in different schools, employees from private and public offices rushed to go out for safety. Electricity posts fell, houses and buildings were burned, and two men riding a vehicle fell in the port while many were injured. A tsunami warning was raised in the city. In a little while, various responding units arrived to help those affected by the strong earthquake. The UNTV News and Rescue Team was among the responders that gave assistance to those affected by the quake. These are just some of the scenarios demonstrated during the Port Quarter Nationwide Simultaneous Earthquake Drill in Calapan City today, where 62 barangays participated. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology or PBOC says the scenario was made 25 years after a 7.1 magnitude earthquake hit in Oriental Mindoro in 1994. Kailangan po natin i-raise awareness ng mga tao uh, na meron pa po ibang active thoughts dito sa uh, Midoro, Midor Island, sa Hulot Midor Island, yung Central Midoro po at yung Southern Midoro po na dapat pa po natin pagandaan. Officers and employees of Breakthrough and Milestone Productions International or BMPI in Caloacan City also participated in the nationwide earthquake drill. The scenario, two employees got injured and were unable to exit the building by themselves. After it was declared the building was safe, the BMPI emergency response team immediately responded to rescue the two wounded employees. The injured were brought to the designated treatment area and given first aid. Authorities remind every family to have a plan as per preparation for possible earthquakes and other calamities. Sa atin sa bahay, unang-una na dapat siguro nagkakausap tayo. Uh, nagkakaroon kayo kumbaga ng plano, contingency plan na in the event na merong nangyari, saan kayo pwedeng magkita-kita after the na may nangyari? Kasi uh, posibilidad na medyo magulo ang sitwasyon. Ano? Uh, hindi, hindi ka basta makasakay ng sasakyan kasi magulo. So, uh, there has to be a place na pwede ninyong magkita-kita. Sherwin Kulubong, UNTB News and Rescue. In other news, the Philippine National Police are ready for any possible changes in the drug war after Vice President Lenny Robredo sought its reassessment. The Vice President and anti-drug SAR agrees that Oplan Tokhang will remain in place. From Pasay City, Vincent Arboleda will tell us why Live. Go ahead, Vincent. Yes, Diego, Philippine National Police Officer in Charge, Police Lieutenant General Archie Gamboa says Oplan Tokhang, a part of PNP's campaign against illegal drugs, will continue. This after Vice President Lenny Robredo expressed her stand to stop senseless killings on the government's drug war. Gamboa said that Oplan Tokhang will somehow undergo retooling. We were able to convince her na meron lang probably ano, repackaging or retooling of how it's going to be presented. But she is convinced that indeed the Philippine anti-drug strategy is already a strategy that can be adopted outright. She's also convinced that indeed yung Tokhang, hindi naman, sabi ko nga, Bisaya kasi kami, no? Tokhang came from a Bisayan word. Pero kung titingnan mo talaga yon, there's no killing in Tokhang. 
The PNP also mulled over creating a new campaign focusing on high-value targets, a move also pushed by VP Robredo when she accepted the position of being the country's drug czar. Meanwhile, lapses in the government's campaign against illegal drugs were revealed during ICAD's enforcement cluster meeting earlier. VP Robredo pointed out the lack of a centralized information system because every agency has its own list that somehow differs from that of other agencies. The LG Undersecretary Rico Judge Echeverri said some local government units mix politics in the drug war. Imaiwasan yung mga barangay, imbis ng ibigay na listahan yung mga totoo, ilalagay nila sa listahan yung makalaban nila sa politika. So, ibevet pa yun ng mga PNP at PIDEA. The Department of Health, for its part, said placing drug pushers in rehabilitation centers worsens the problem as they tend to create new networking for illegal drugs. A concern also raised by the Bureau of Jail Management and Penology. Kahit sa BJMP, yung mga detention prisoners, nahahalo yung accused of drug use sa mga hindi accused of drug use, nagkakaroon din ng hawaan. para yung contamination. To solve these issues, the Vice President recommend the creation of a technical working group to tackle the recommendation of policies to fill the gaps in the system. Hopefully, by early next week, meron ng PWG. Na before the end of the year, ang target ko nga when when I get invited to the House of Representatives Committee on Dangerous Drugs, ma present na yung hihingi na tulong from Congress. The Vice President also gave the agencies a deadline of up to the end of the year to create the metrics and gathering and collating data from various agencies and operations. Diego, according to VP Robredo, this will give the country a baseline to create policies and programs better suited to the Philippines. And that's the latest live. Back to you, Diego. Thank you, Vincent Arboleda, reporting live from Pasay City. Vice President Lenny Robredo should be thankful she is not yet required to attend cabinet meetings, according to presidential spokesperson Salvador Panelo. Meanwhile, President Duterte cancels his scheduled meeting with farmers in North Cotabato. Rosalie Cos explains why. Presidential Spokesperson and Chief Presidential Legal Counsel Salvador Panelo says no invitation has been sent yet to Vice President Lenny Robredo to attend a cabinet meeting. The palace official also confirms the country's second top leader will only be invited to the meeting if the issue on illegal drugs is in the agenda. Kung hindi ka naman kasama dun sa agenda, mas masaya siguro kung hindi ka na atin. Kaya that's why I said, you should be thankful. Pupunta ka lang kung, alam mo, topic mo. The official adds, it is optional for cabinet members to attend the meeting, especially if a cabinet official is not concerned with the topics in the meeting. When we have a cabinet meeting, we are invited by the CABSEC and we are asked if we are going or not. In other words, it's optional for us to attend. However, Secretary Panelo clarifies the Vice President can state her side on any issue discussed in the meeting by submitting a statement or comment. Meanwhile, President Duterte has cancelled his scheduled talk with the farmers of North Cotabato tomorrow. Instead, he will visit the wake of the soldiers killed as well as those wounded when the government forces were attacked by the New People's Army in Eastern Samar. Rosalie Coz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. A Filipino-owned direct marketing organization demonstrates how its organic solution reduces the pollution level of water. Environment Secretary Roy Simatu says they will mull over using such organic solution in rehabilitating Manila Bay. Ray Pelayo details why. Water flowing in this creek located in front of the Office of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, National Capital Region, East Avenue, Quezon City, emits foul odor. An organic solution was applied to the water claimed to reduce its pollution level. This organic solution was developed by CHC Agritech. It's 100% organic, so pwede siyang inumin ng tao, pwede inumin ng hayo. Secretary Roy Simatu personally witnessed how the organic solution affected the water in the creek. The DNR chief said the department will assess if the solution can be used for the rehabilitation of Manila Bay. The DNR targets to make Manila Bay along the Baywalk area 
swimmable before the year ends. Ang first uh, ano natin is maklin up yung Manila Bay, yung fecal coliform, yun yung pinaka-target natin na mapababa. Tapos secondary na yung BOD, tapos syempre yung dissolved oxygen para kahit papano pwedeng mamuhay dun yung mga isda. Three outfalls will be integrated into one. Then, a treatment plant will be set up at the Manila Yacht Club in Rojas Boulevard. Especially kung nandiyan na yung treatment plant, talagang bababa na yun. Kasi yung mga matatas na coliform dyan, matri-treat dito. The DNR will hire almost 2,000 personnel to man the creeks in the metro that are connected to Manila Bay. Kasi kahit maglinis-linis tayo sa uh, dagat, kung tuloy-tuloy pa rin pagbaba yung garbage coming from desteros, ay katong pa rin. So we have to uh, solve the problem in the sources. Secretary Simato said they will replace the mud with sand in the first week of December. Ray Pelayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Welcome back to Wine News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I'm Alex Baltazar and here are the headlines. A Solon clarifies there is no error in the 507 million peso proposed budget for the rehabilitation of Canon Road in Baguio City. President Rodrigo Duterte to validate reports on two members of the cabinet allegedly involved in corrupt practices as claimed by the Presidential Anti-Corruption Commission. House Speaker Alan Peter Cayetano says he will follow the term-sharing deal with Maranduque Representative Lord Alan Velasco as brokered by President Rodrigo Duterte. And World Health Organization to make life-saving insulin affordable in low-middle-income countries. First in our news, as Solon clarifies the 507 million peso proposed budget for the rehabilitation of Kenon Road in the 2020 national budget is not a typo error. He also remains firm the House version of the budget has no parked funds. Harleen Delgado explains why. House Deputy Speaker and Camarina Sur 2nd District Representative Erle Villafuerte clarified there was no error in the proposed budget for the rehabilitation of Cannon Road in Baguio City. This after his remark in a television interview about the supposed typo error in the proposed budget of the Department of Public Works and Highways or DPWH. According to Villafuerte, he was referring to the supposed request for a road project in Cagayan Valley worth 15 million pesos that Senator Panfilo Lacks as earlier noted in the House version of the budget. I never mentioned the man 500 million or 570 interview. I was referring to the 15 million. Yun yung uh, ni Senator Ping na kinat in peace na may nakalagi request. But in the same interview, when asked about the correct allotted budget for the Cannon Road Rehab, the Solon said it was only 15 million. In the 2020 National Expenditure Program, the DPWH has a $4 billion budget for the rehabilitation or reconstruction of primary roads. Under the Cordillera Administrative Region, 504 million pesos was allotted for the Cannon Road rehabilitation. Despite this, Villafuerte stands firm that the House version of the bill which they submitted last October remains pork-free. Ang pinasa namin na budget sa 2020 sa Senado, pork-free parking fee. Nga pong uh, isa or dalawang uh, type of error lang naman yan. And hindi naman pork yan. Siguro ano naman, uh, pwede, pwede pa naman i-correct yan dito sa PICAM. But during the Senate's budget deliberations, Lacson was puzzled as to how the Solon can claim these things. Later in the day, he corrected himself and said he was actually referring to a 15 million peso uh, project or project request actually in Cagayan province. Mr. President, how could he even know that? Senate has started its marathon sessions for the 4.1 trillion 2020 national budget deliberation targeted to be signed by December 15. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue House of Representatives. Some senators believe there is poor planning in some infrastructure projects listed under the proposed 2020 budget of the Department of Public Works and Highways. Meanwhile, the DPWH reports to senators that 28 of the 75 flagship projects have already been removed by the Duterte administration. Nelmarie Bohok reports why. 
The Senate plenary yet again tackled today the budget of the Department of Public Works and Highways or DPWH. Senator Panfilo Lacson sees that some of the projects have no details. These include the 150 million peso Manila North Road, 156.6 million peso Jose Abad Santos Avenue, Quezon City projects worth more than 276 million pesos, and various roads in Taguig City with a 315 million peso appropriation. The DPWH, however, response those items have details which it will submit to Congress. According to Senator Lacson, what he says is poor planning in the submitted infrastructure projects. Kasi kung nasa gaana, saka pa lang tayo magmamodify o kaya, of course, authorized naman kayo magmodify, ano? Pero reflective ng medyo may problema sa planning. The Senator also observed a copy-paste budgeting in some projects. Talagang bothersome yun dahil the same segment na nag-overlap na nga, pag sabit nila sa budget bill, yung pa rin pinapapondohan ulit. The Senator meanwhile understands some projects have been endorsed by some congressmen. Meanwhile, Senate Minority Leader Franklin Drilon again asked clarifications on the administration's 75 flagship projects which eventually increased to 100. According to the DPWH, 28 out of 75 projects have already been removed. 12 of those are DPWH projects. These include connecting bridges from one island to another in Visayas region as well as different bridge projects in Metro Manila and other provinces. According to DPWH, WH Secretary Mark Villar, those big ticket projects need to undergo the vetting process. That is why some of the projects need to be withdrawn after thorough study, Secretary Villar says. Kung yung mga projects na hindi na hindi naman mataas yung uh, economic rate of return at may babaling benefit, mas pinili namin yung mga projects na may mas mataas na return, mas mataas na impact. The DPWH targets to start all the 100 infra projects before President Duterte's term ends. Nel Maribuhok, UN TV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The Presidential Anti-Corruption Commission, or PACC, has submitted to President Rodrigo Duterte the result of its investigation against two cabinet members allegedly involved in corruption. PACC Commissioner Greco Bellica said it is up to President Duterte if he will publicize the names or not. Meanwhile, according to Presidential Spokesperson and Chief Presidential Legal Counsel Salvador Panello, the Chief Executive will also investigate the report. There is no need to discuss the issue of term sharing with Marinduque Representative Lord Alan Velasco, says House Speaker Alan Cayetano. Maya Bermudez will tell us why. Amid the calls of several congressmen to extend his term, which will lapse in December 2020 based on term sharing agreement, House Speaker Alan Gaetano says there's no need to discuss the issue with Marinduque Representative Lord Alan Velasco. Hindi naman kasi kailang pag-usapan eh. So we say hi to each other, but that's it, di ba? So in fact, halos wala akong congressman na nakakausap na pinag-uusapan speakership, parating trabaho. Once in a while, meron, meron papasyal sa office na speaker, sana hindi ka na mapalitan. Pati standard pa rin yung answer ko. Kaya um, hindi kita ko kontrahin, pero... Based on the agreement, Cayetano has 15 months and will be superseded by Velasco, who will be given 21 months. President Duterte has earlier said he won't meddle because it will be up to the lower house if it will honor the term-sharing deal. But Cayetano says Velasco has nothing to worry about as he will respect the president's decision. No one can take over. By just saying, ikaw na din. Diba? Kasi wala naman vice speaker. So, but as I said, it's very unproductive and speculative, uh, very speculative to talk about something na 15 months from now. The lower chamber is set to vote on who will be the next speaker of the house. My Bermudez, UNTV News and Rescue, Tagaytay City. The Armed Forces of the Philippines, or AFP, will conduct consultations in different parts of Mindanao. Meanwhile, AFP Chief of Staff General Noel Clement visited West Mincon today. Dante Amento tells us why. 
The Armed Forces of the Philippines or AFP must know the position of the local government units and the stakeholders in Mindanao on the martial law extension. AFP Chief of Staff General Noel Clement says the people of Mindanao are the ones who will be directly affected by the move. The information gathered during consultations will be used in the AFP's recommendation on whether to terminate or extend martial law in the region. Part of our assessment will be to conduct a consultation sa ating mga stakeholders, mga local government chief executives natin, ating mga taong bayan, kung uh, hinahangad pa ba nila na ipagpatuloy ang pagpapatupad ng martial law. The AFP admit martial law has brought good result, especially in the security in the region. The AFP chief says he is in favor of selective martial law extension. Kung kikinyan talaga natin na medyo matagal na, but of course, if, uh, kung may pangangailangan, ay i-recommend natin, but uh, that will uh, depend on the assessments that will be coming up. Sulu province is one of the areas that may be included in another martial law extension. Former Sulu Governor Abdul Sakortan Sr., on the other hand, is against the move. Ay, taman walang martial law, may patak taman. May uh, insal law enforcement. Yung tao hindi dapat uh, out of fear. It should be out of respect. Meanwhile, General Clement visited the Western Mindanao Command for the first time as the AFP chief today. He reiterated the president's mandate to prioritize the neutralization of local threat groups, particularly in Mindanao. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue, Zamboanga City. The Department of Agriculture will continue the full implementation of the rice tariffication law. This despite the criticisms against the law that removes the limitation of importing rice. Ray Palayo reports why. The government will continue the implementation of the rice tarification law despite the holding of farmers due to its effects on the prices of rice. Department of Agriculture Secretary William Dar says the law will not be subjected to review. He also appeals to give it a chance. Give the law a chance to be implemented properly. So after uh, some time, if there will be some little adjustments to make it much more effective, then that's the period when we shall revise it. The Philippines has beaten China when it comes to the volume of imported rice, which is now almost 3 million metric tons. China has billions of population, while the Philippines has only more than 100 million. The rice certification law removes the limitation of importing rice. But the agriculture chief said they will implement stricter issuance of import clearances, especially during harvest season. Secretary Dar praises the local governments that buy local farmers' produce. He stresses this is why the price of rice has decreased, like what had been reported in Isabela, where the price of commercial rice is almost the same as that of NFA rice. Maganda yan kasi kung 27 pesos per kilo yes, ay uh, maganda po yung intervention na ginawa ng provincial government. The DA is now using the 10 billion peso fund to help local farmers increase their produce. But the Federation of Free Farmers has previously stated farmers are already losing 50 billion pesos due to the low price of palay. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Meanwhile, displaced street vendors in Kazan City will not fear of eviction anymore. This as the local government has found a way to help them continue their livelihood. Bernard Dadis explains why. Colorful tents, no rental fee, uniform, membership ID, all of these awaits vendors displaced from the streets and sidewalks of Quezon City. What's more, there will be a stage dedicated for local artists and singers who will perform as additional attraction for customers. This is what the Quezon City government offers in the upcoming opening of Sari Sari Sakusi 2019 Night Market that will run from November 23 and until 
January 19, 2020. Ang ginawa natin ay pinarehistro ang mga vendors na didisplace. Lahat ngayon sila, dalawang libo, ay rehistrado sa lungsod. At uh, sila ngayon ay, pag sinabing lehiti mo, aalagaan namin sila, hahanapan namin sila ng lugar kung saan sila pwede magbeta ng kanilang mga pagkabuhay. Ano. Each vendor will just have to pay 150 pesos a day for utility fees including use of electricity. According to Mayor Belmonte, that is much cheaper compared with the protection fee collected by illegal organizers in prohibited spaces in Quezon City ranging between 300 and 600 pesos a day depending on the location. The first night market is located in the TUCP compound corner elliptical and Maharlika Road. It's open from 3 p.m. until midnight. Another is in Ayala Bertis North which is open from 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. Nagpapasalamat po ako sa Quezon City Government lalo lalo na kay Mayor Joy Belmonte na binigyan niya kami ng pagkakataon na magkaroon ng uh, legal na pagtitindahan. Kami ang nagmamarket sa kanila, kami ang magsisiguro na may mga pupunta at bibili ng mga produkto nila. The project also includes Suki sa QC Club, in which registered displaced vendors can learn business and trade skills and know-how. Mayor Belmonte plans to establish more night markets in the city and expand public markets to give space for the displayed street vendors. She also reiterates they will keep the cleared streets free from obstructions and vows to make barangay officials who neglect their duties accountable. Kung may mamatigas, eh, sabi ng DILG, isumbong lang sa kanila at sila nang bahala magsuspende. Kung sa tingin nila ay hindi nagko-cooperate ang mga barangay officials po natin. Bernard Daddy's UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The World Health Organization launched a program to ensure insulin-dependent diabetics have access to life-saving treatment in low- and middle-income countries by increasing patient choice and lowering prices. The measure was announced ahead of World Diabetes Day and is part of a pilot program that will address the fact the number of diabetics continues to rise globally, but access to medicine is not free-flowing. Stephanie C. reports. With insulin prices skyrocketing and substantial shortages developing in poorer countries, the World Health Organization said on Wednesday that it would begin testing and approving generic versions of the drug. Diabetes is a massive health issue and a big public health problem because of the sheer numbers of people with diabetes. There are over 400 million people that have diabetes in the world and the burden has been rising rapidly in the last 30 years, particularly in low and middle income countries. Agency officials said they hope to drive down insulin prices by encouraging makers of generic drugs to enter the market, increasing competition. At the moment, the world's insulin market is dominated by three companies, Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk and Sanofi and they have steadily pushed up prices for two decades. When WHO started pre-qualifying HIV medicines the price per person was $10,000 per year. Once we started to pre-qualify after three years the price per person was $300 per year. That's really a substantial difference. The approval process, which the WHO calls pre-qualification, will permit United Nations agencies and medical charities like Doctors Without Borders to buy approved generic versions of insulin. According to WHO, some 65 million people with type 2 diabetes need insulin, but only half of them can access the medicine primarily because the cost is too high. In Southeast Asia, almost 600,000 people died from the disease in 20. 17, the highest figure recorded globally. One of the biggest risk factors for developing diabetes is being overweight or obese. Rates of obesity have continued to grow in many countries. Experts predict that by 2045, India will overtake China with some 134 million suffering from diabetes. Stephanie C, UNTV News and Rescue. To complete the most significant news for this day, Y News continues. Here are the top stories. 
For the first time, the Brazilian embassy in the Philippines invited Brazilian beef exporters and their counterpart Filipino importers. The event aims to boost the Brazilian beef market in the country and to impart the Brazilian culture to Filipinos. June Soryao has more details. Brazilian chefs Gerson Gonçalves and Hamilton Dos Santos Teixeira traveled for 30 hours all the way from the world's fifth largest country to the Philippines to share the world-famous churrasco or authentic Brazilian barbecue. It's easy and simple to prepare churrasco. There's no need to marinate this premium-grade Brazilian beef. Just put the meat straight to the grill, sprinkle salt, and its natural flavor and aroma will come out. Vamos provar. Bem, bem, bem passada. Bem passada. Saboroso. Delícia. According to Brazilian ambassador to the Philippines, Rodrigo do Amaral Souza, the love of Brazilians to beef is deeply rooted. The official wants to impart to Filipinos this part of the Brazilian culture. Churrasco in Brazil is not only um, a place you go to enjoy a meal, it's a life experience. It's something that uh, gathers people together and uh, it's a moment you have to relax and to share a laugh and to share good moments with your friends and your pals. In the gathering of the Brazilian Beef Exporters Association and Filipino Importers in Makati City last night, Ambassador Amarao said the Philippines' beef import from Brazil has increased. From January to October 2019, it increased by 32% compared with that in the same period last year. Brazil is the world's second largest beef producer, making up over 15% of the world's beef according to the United States Department of Agriculture. While the Philippines is the largest market of Brazilian beef among the member states of the Association of Southeast Asian Nation or ASEAN. Actually, Philippines is a very relevant market for our associations. Uh, we have more than 30 companies mm -hmm. that export to Philippines, so it's an important market in Asia. In Brazil, cattle can freely roam and graze in vast grasslands. This is one of the secrets to rich and tasty beef. Jun Suriao, UNTV, News and Rescue, Makati City. And for the news abroad, here's Kath Dumaraos, live from Bangkok, Thailand. Kath, good evening. Good evening, Alex. A top U.S. diplomat told impeachment hearings that President Trump directly asked about a Ukrainian investigation into his Democratic rival, Joe Biden. In previously unheard testimony, Bill Taylor, the acting U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, said a member of his staff was told Trump was preoccupied with pushing for a probe into Mr. Biden. He was speaking at the first public hearings in the impeachment inquiry. Trump told reporters he did not recall making such comments. The U.S. president is accused of withholding U.S. military aid to Ukraine in order to pressure the country's new president to publicly announce a corruption inquiry into Mr. Biden, among the favorites to take him on in the 2020 presidential race. The mayor of Venice is set to declare a state of disaster after the city was flooded during the highest tide in over half a century. Meanwhile, the death toll in the bushfires raging across Australia's New South Wales state has risen to four after a man's body was found in a scorched forest as authorities warned of worsening weather conditions to come. Jovic Burmas details why. In Australia, Australian authorities say a fourth person has died in a week of massive bushfires on the nation's east coast. The 58-year-old man's body was found in northern New South Wales on Thursday, days after a fire ripped through the region. 
Crews are still battling over 120 fires in New South Wales and Queensland, but locals in Western Australia have now been warned of extremely dangerous conditions. Police charged a 16-year-old boy with deliberately starting a damaging fire. The alleged arson had destroyed 14 homes around the town of Yepun, Queensland police said. Meanwhile, United Nations weather experts echoed government's warnings for people to remain vigilant in the face of the fast-moving threat and tinderbox conditions. Citing Australia's Bureau of Meteorology description of the situation as evolving and dangerous, Claire Knowles, the spokesperson for the World Meteorological Organization, said that conditions were likely to remain dry with little to no rain forecast. Apart from the immediate physical threat and you know, when authorities issue of a catastrophic fire danger, the message there is basically get out, get away. New South Wales has declared a state of emergency as parts of the state, including the greater Sydney area and Queensland, face a catastrophic fire danger, the highest level of warning. In Venice, two people have died as the highest water levels for more than 50 years caused hundreds of millions of euros of possibly irreparable damage in Venice. Officials have said, with another surge expected to cause further flooding. Flood levels in the Lagoon City reached the second highest level since records began in 1923 as a result of the Aqua Alta. An elderly local man from Palestrina, one of the many islands in the Venetian Lagoon, died when he was struck by lightning while using an electric water pump, the fire brigade said. The body of another man was found in his home. More than 85% of Venice was flooded, authorities said. While the water level dropped slightly on Wednesday morning, a further torrent of water whipped up by high winds is forecast to sweep in later in the day. The mayor of Venice, Luigi Brognaro, said he would declare a state of emergency, adding that the flood levels represented a wound that would leave indelible marks. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue. Environmental groups warn that the amount of waste accumulated by China's e-commerce and express delivery sectors could be more than quadruple by 2025 unless action is taken to reduce it. This as the online shopping spree known as Singles Day sets sales records. Details in this report. As Singles Day has laid bare, e-commerce is growing at a dizzying speed in China, but this boom has also led to a brutal increase in the volume of packaging and waste, according to an environmental report. And despite this increase, no initiatives or environmental policies have been championed to make the sector sustainable. A joint report by Greenpeace Asia, Rick Free from Plastic China, and the All China Environment Federation revealed. Environmental NGOs say that plastic packaging is not recycled 95% of the time. Plastic waste gets mixed with solid waste and ends up in landfill 60% of the time and incinerators 40% of the time. This will likely escalate this year since the sales of e-commerce giants such as Alibaba was 26% higher than last year. The report said that in 2018, packaging materials used by e-commerce and food delivery sectors reached a cumulative 9.4 million tons, 3.5 times the amount of tea that China produced. Sources from the company said that it has implemented new practices such as the use of electronic labels instead of paper and the development of an intelligent packaging algorithm which classifies products and bundles them so that packaging is more efficient and less wasteful by up to 15%. According to the NGOs, lawmakers need to accelerate legislation to demand and invent sustainable packaging. Kat Dumaraos, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Kat Dumaraos, reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand. Gilas Filipinas Women competes for the FIBA Women's Olympic Pre-Qualifying Tournament in New Zealand. They also thank the Filipino community in Auckland for their support. Paul Gatshalian details why. Gilas Filipinas Women are now in New Zealand for the International Basketball Federation or FIBA Women's Olympic Pre-Qualifying Tournament held in Auckland. The Filipino team is on Group A of the Asia Oceania Division together with China, New Zealand, and South Korea. 
Gilas Pilipinas women this afternoon bowed to New Zealand 111 to 54 at the Trusts Arena. The Philippines still has two games to reach the Olympic qualifying tournament for the 2020 Tokyo Games, with the top two teams from groups A and B advancing. Well, our strategy right now is really to play our best. You know, we're, we're playing against the best teams in Asia and uh, as much as possible. We try to be smaller than them, so we try to run and uh, use our shooting. Uh, Gilas women may lack in height but never in their shooting abilities. The team is also grateful for the support of the Filipino community in New Zealand. Punong mga kababayan namin na nandito sa New Zealand, maraming maraming salamat po sa support nyo. Pagdating pa lang po namin sa airport, grabe, feel na feel na po namin na parang nasa Pilipinas lang din kami kasi ang dami po nilang sumalubong sa amin and sobrang masaya po kami and nakakadagdag yun sa confidence namin para mas maglaro pa po ng mabuti and para po sa, sa kanila. Currently tied with China at the bottom of Group A, Gilas Pilipinas women must defeat South Korea in their match on Saturday, November 16, to bolster their chances of a top 2 finish. Meanwhile, Gilas Pilipinas women will do all their best to achieve a gold medal in the upcoming Southeast Asia or SEA Games in the Philippines. Paul Gachalian, UNTV News and Rescue, Oakland, New Zealand. The security preparations for the Southeast Asian Games are all set. PNP spokesperson Police Brigadier General Bernard Banak says 27,000 policemen will be deployed in the venues, but the police's regular duty will not be affected. Leia Ilagan tells us why. The Philippine National Police Security preparations for the Southeast Asian Games are all set. PNP spokesperson Police Brigadier General Bernard Banak says 27,000 policemen will be deployed in the venues, convoys, and billeting areas of the delegates and heads of states. The police official, however, refuses to give the specific number of personnel to be deployed in the billeting area for security reasons. Uh, may bibigay natin na assurance sa ating mga pabayan na ang lahat ng mga delegado, mga atleta, uh, lalong-lalo na yung mga dayuhan, ay uh, may uh, kaukulang security uh, coverage at uh, tinitiyak natin ng seguridad uh, para sa lahat. Of the 27,000 policemen, 8,000 are from the National Capital Region Police Office, while others are from Police Regional Office 3 or the Central Luzon, Ilocos Region or Pro 1, and Calabar Zone Area or Pro 4A. The police forces are composed of the Quick Reaction Team and Explosives and Ordnance Division. Canine units will also be deployed. The Police Security and Protection Group will manage the security for the VIPs and delegates. The PNP Highway Patrol Group is tasked to secure the route and convoy. The Presidential Security Group or PSG is also part of the deployed personnel. Brigadier General Bernard Banak adds the regular duty of the police personnel deployed in the SEA Games will not be affected. Sa ngayon, uh, wala po tayong natatanggap na numang banta sa ating seguridad. Subalit, uh, nananatili tayong uh, alerto at mapagmatyag uh, sa anumang magiging kaganapan at uh, tinitiyak natin sa ating mga kababayan na uh, handa ang PNP na tumugon kung ano man ang pangailangan o mayroong mga emergency uh, sa panahon ito. The SEA Games will run from November 30 to December 11, 2019. Leia Ilagan, UNTV. News and Rescue, Camp Kramit. Traffic law enforcement agencies conducted today a simulation of the traffic scheme to be implemented in the 2019 SEA Games. According to the MMDA, one of the problems they encountered is that many private vehicles use the yellow lane designated for the SEA Games delegates. Asher Kadapan Jr. details why. About 10,000 athletes will participate in the forthcoming 2019 Southeast Asia or Sea Games, which the country hosts until December 11. Most of them will be billeted in 22 hotels across Metro Manila, while others will be coming from Tagaytay City, Subic Zambales, and Clark Pampanga. Participants will have to travel from different sports facilities, mostly located in the metropolis. With this, Heavier traffic is expected while the multi-sports event is ongoing. 
to help with the transportation of the participants, the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, Land Transportation Office, and other traffic law enforcement agencies will implement the Stop and Go Scheme. The scheme aims to temporarily hold the flow of vehicles to give way to the traversing bus convoys to allow faster commute to their destination as there are no special lanes dedicated for their convoys. The Interagency Council implemented the scheme in the dry run today. Uh, the reason why we're conducting simulation ay para po makita natin yung kahandaan, yung mga bagay na pwedeng i-improve, ano po yung mga pagkukulang. So naging uh, problema po natin dito yung mga private vehicles na nakikipagsiksikan din ho sa yellow lane which is nauna na ho natin naging advisory na ang yellow lane po ay i-maximize para ho sa ating mga convoys. According to the MMDA, Two out of the seven schools recommended for class holiday have already confirmed their class suspension, namely LaSalle Taft and LaSalle Benilde, from the 2nd to the 7th of December. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. And those are the reasons behind the news this November 14, 2019. On behalf of Angelo Castro III, I am Alex Baltazar. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening.